Hello, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure, uh, actually, and I'm proud of opening with my brief talk. Uh, the first uh, scholarly conference dedicated to uh, LARPs here in the European University in Petersburg. Uh, why here? It's a tricky question. Uh, actually, uh, we are graduate college for humanities and social sciences. Uh, uh, this university was created uh, in mid-1990s when in this country there was a very narrow period, a brief window of opportunities when new institutions were being created easily. Now uh, we emerged like one of the leading schools in humanities and social sciences and uh, at some point our graduate students uh, proposed uh, role-playing games uh, as a research topic because they actually did belong and still are belonging to the community of uh, those uh, who practice this as a leisure activity. Oh. <clears throat> But actually, in the beginning, we had a hard time explaining uh, why in the world uh, anthropologists should study role-playing games. Those who used to study LARPs in Russia uh, for a couple of decades by now uh, studied them mainly as a community of strange people uh, with their own folklore mainly based on fantasy fiction. That is, they studied people and what they were doing around role-playing but not role-playing itself. But a different approach is also possible. And anthropologists these days even explore virtual worlds uh, of multiplayer online games. Uh, LARPs might turn out uh, to be an important topic for contemporary anthropology. Uh, it is my conviction. Uh, but only in case if we use role-playing games as a crystal ball. Uh, that would enable us to see in LARPs something more, something more than LARPs. What, what's that? As anthropologists, we pay special attention to what we call symbolic behavior. Gaming and playing, as well as ritual, are species of symbolic behavior. Uh, and of course, we could tell that uh, traditionally uh, anthropologists uh, used to study socialization and playing as part of uh, socialization and entertainment, as part of folklore. They studied toys as artifacts and their aesthetics and children's play that might be the traces of previous states of society. But all this is also something rather around the activity of playing or LARPing, not the activity itself. Anthropologists uh, can legitimately problematize and study, uh, say, football fans and hooligans as a subcultural group and their practices. But it is not the same as studying football itself. Why then LARP is better than football and more for the study? <coughs> uh, here in LARP, young adult people uh, practice a kind of amateur improvisational theater as an entertainment and leisure activity and imagine themselves uh, to act in fictional worlds. Their stage and props are sometimes rather elaborate, but in many respects rudimentary, which doesn't spoil their group immersion and the shared illusion within which they interact uh, so that to develop a plot line. This is obviously a pretend play that with its forms and the emotional involvement of the participants cannot but remind some other types of cultural activity. And this is not because LARPs reproduce them as part of the game world. Let's take a wider look at what symbolic behavior is. Much of that culturally patent activity that is observed uh, in any culture has no direct pragmatic efficiency in terms of scientific knowledge, of cause and effect. This is readily not noticeable when the observer finds herself in a different, more or less exotic society, just to find that many everyday things here, where we, we came to an exotic place, Papua New Guinea, 
uh, the everyday things differ from the routines to which uh, we are accustomed. For instance, people, I don't know, uh, it, it's a, it, an imaginary example, uh, wash their hands not before eating their meals, but after. They don't sit on chairs, but on straw mats. Uh, eat with chop using chopsticks, not spoons and forks. This may m make the observer think that these customs are irrelevant to the accomplishment of the general purpose of a particular activity. One may wash the hands before or after, or even not wash them at all. Indeed, this choice does not influence the result of the general act of eating. This choice is just a form of the etiquette. This is often an external observer, because the natives might pretty well insist on performing the custom and punish those who break the rules and don't wash the hands. The observer then would remind this attitude as interesting piece of data reflecting local customs and will try to find out why this particular custom is so important to the natives and with what particular local cultural values it has to do. Uh, <coughs> to an external observer, much of cultural behavior seems not obligatory, kind of a result of a free choice uh, uh, to that, uh, and that, uh, that was made uh, at some point by the ancestors, and then people followed the same choice thoughtlessly as a tradition, as if the choice was meaningful, but it was not, it was arbitrary. Each society made its choices with a certain degree of arbitrariness, uh, and has imposed more or less arbitrary taboos. Say, if to call the rain they dance all night and feel that otherwise the rain wouldn't come, the form of the dance can easily have some hints to the way in which the natives imagine the causes of the rain, to contain references to the deities and spirits that are according to local view responsible for rains and agricultural fertility. <clears throat> Many years ago I saw an announcement in a Russian newspaper an enterprise, uh, it wasn't advertising. Uh, an enterprise offered its services to those who worked in agriculture. They said, you place an order with us, we apply our method and the rain come, comes. You only pay if the meteorologists testify that precipitation for that particular period turned out to be at least 5% more than it had been expected in weather forecast. They didn't specify the method that was to be applied. As you see, this is a great business idea. Even if you do nothing to provoke rain, in some cases, there are more precipitations than the forecast uh, announced, and you'd get your money. So much of what people do around the world, in all the cultures, both in traditional cultures and in Western civilization, would seem like sort of a rain dance to the observer who, who has come from other planets uh, and who knows the real causes and mechanisms behind natural events such as rain. Some of these performances are really elaborate and artistic, involve native technology uh, and much effort from the part of the natives. Uh, a stranger would call magic some part of this, and would call ritual some other part. In order to understand the local worldview, ethnographer would have to immerse deep into everyday life, to live among the natives for months, to learn their language and to take part in their rights. This would enable her to see the world in the way the locals do, at least to some extent. Even though we from outside regard the natives' acts like rain dances as empty moves devoid of natural efficiency based on scientific knowledge of cause and effects. Uh, these moves, these acts still remain efficient for natives because within their, their worldview cause and effect links are different. Take medicine and healing uh, as an example. Many of our ideas uh, uh, about health and uh, medicine are actually everyday mythologies. 
uh, ideas that are exploited by medical professionals and healers. At the same time, we cannot say that medical knowledge, be it in form of scientific biomedicine or in alternative healing traditions, we cannot say it is inefficient. Both doctors and healers are efficient. Mm. Even though they operate with entities that, that are unseen and unknown to their clients. And here the important point comes, the unseen. Studying the unseen worlds is common for anthropology that attempt to describe the worldviews involving spiritual beings like ghosts. When taking part in a game event, LARPers can seem very much like native performing their rights to an outside observer. For someone who is not part of the LARP, participants' behavior would seem strange to say the least. They act as if they were on a stage, but most of them are not like actors. Uh, and even though the whole performance looks poor as a show, uh, to participants is full of meaning. They perceive amateurish acting of other participants as quite sensible and accountable in terms of the game world. And they invest their emotions into what's going on in the game. There's certainly something unseen here, something that is invisible to outside observers, but perfectly visible and relevant for the game world and its participants. That is to say, participants see something that outsiders do not, and participants disregard some aspects of the reality that surround them. Those who are part of the game world would be unable to see some elements of the environment that surround them. Even within the game uh, uh, world itself, different groups of participants can see different things, uh, are supposed to see different ranges of in-game reality, and they show that they don't see certain things. So uh, this is a question of the nature of shared pretense and shared theatrical illusion. The first study of LARP at our Department of Anthropology was dedicated to immersion and to LARP participants' awareness of frame switching. And here is Olga Vorobyova, who is uh, precisely that uh, person who did it. Uh, <laughs> so if we consider the shared in-game immersion of participants as an accomplishment, what do participants do in order to maintain their shared delusion? That was one of the principal questions. Uh, actually, um, performative nature of social reality has been thoroughly described by Erwin Goffman and uh, the study of Olga uh, attempted to use systematic self-observation of participants as a source of data on perceived disruptions of shared delusion and uh, uh, the means people employ to repair uh, these disruptions. This is the micro level of the study of social interaction. At the macro level, uh, the relevance of uh, the studies of uh, this shared illusion uh, might make us recall some theories uh, by several persons, but primarily, and because we are now in Russia, uh, I will mention Nikolai Yevreinov, uh, a stage director, playwright, and theorist of theater, who proposed the theory, uh, even though this theory was not formally uh, like a scholarly treatise, a, a theory of cultural behavior uh, as role play, uh, he introduced such term as uh, theater for oneself. Uh, a theory that uh, actually this theory belonged to its time, uh, to the beginning of 20th century, the first half of 20th century, even though it claimed for universality, because Ivrenov 
uh, used to look for theatricality, not only in everyday behavior, uh, but uh, in animal world, for example. He thought that theater was a universal instinct, uh, especially important for humans. Uh, and uh, Nikolai Yevrenov uh, was, uh, on a practical level, the author of a uh, psychotherapeutic method uh, that uh, uh, some years later was uh, in a more developed form proposed by Moreno as psychodrama. Uh, but uh, actually this theory could uh, appear only at that time because at that epoch people used to appreciate eccentricity, being plain and being sincere, to uh, open uh, your internal content to everyone, to be frank and honest. Uh, would just not be appreciated by other people uh, just because what interesting things can you have there inside? Everyone has more or less the same. But if you invent something from you, if you play a role, if you make something eccentric, this attracts people's attention and makes you interesting. That's why eccentricity was a starting point of studying uh, the semiotics of everyday behavior for um, Yevrein. Mm. Uh, and generally I think that uh, the theatrical practices and theories might be underestimated as tools for understanding LAR practices and maybe also for constructing them. And here comes another important point having to do with the theory and the practice uh, of uh, organizing and inventing uh, role-playing games. Uh, I explain it to me that this is like uh, what took place when in cognitive studies researchers came to the conclusion that the interaction between people and machines or artificial intelligent agents uh, cannot be understood without emotional aspects. So, robots and uh, animated uh, people like uh, uh, quasi-persons that uh, can, be, can appear in the interface uh, should not just talk to you in plain language, but they also need to express emotions and they need to recognize users' emotions too. So, uh, uh, within cognitive studies, uh, people started uh, developing systems that imitated emotions and were aimed at recognizing emotions. And that led to very practically oriented theories of how internal states of people can be represented as multidimensional space. And um, there was a problem of mapping this uh, multidimensional space of emotional, emotional, quasi-emotional, not all of them. Being tired is an internal state, but it's not an emotion. But being tired uh, should be something that a robot or uh, animated uh, person uh, should be able to represent. So uh, we have a space of states and space of possible expressions and map one into another. Uh, <clears throat> so this uh, made an advance, uh, advancement uh, in a theory of emotion. So uh, uh, that's something I mean like uh, the situation here when people who conduct and organize LARPs start to reflect uh, upon their practice and start uh, reading theories in adjacent fields. 
uh, to develop their own theories that uh, can be applied to constructing people's experiences in LARP. So uh, that's why most of the scholarship, and that was a problem uh, uh, within academic field, because when Olga or someone else, Anna, uh, exposed some of their ideas before scholarly academic audiences, they told, oh, everything you say is about how to make a good LARP. It's not a, a, an academic theory. What do we know new about, about what? About micromechanics of social interaction? Yes, if we go on on this Goffmanian way. Uh, uh, we also see how people maintain uh, the reality, social reality. Uh, and this, this is already legalized. Uh, as a domain of academic study of law. But the other things uh, seem to be very applied studies. Uh, well, but you know, when uh, anthropologist, uh, an anthropologist comes to a strange place, uh, to Papua New Guinea, to say the least, uh, and uh, starts studying some interesting ritual practices. Not very often she meets a person who would be a ritual specialist with a very theoretical view and ref reflecting on uh, his or her own practices. Uh, that would be great to have people organizing rituals in traditional culture uh, if, if those people uh, had also anthropological um, education and could explain everything about the ritual from their own experience of organizing rituals. But with LARPs, we have something like that indeed. Because those who uh, uh, organize experiences of uh, LARP participants, they they don't do it from scratch. And what they invent is within uh, the general, uh, general possibilities uh, of how ritual events can be organized. Uh, that is why um, I think that uh, uh, LARPers who reflect on their practices can be like ritual specialists. Uh, telling about the experiences and uh, opening new avenues of research in ritual. <clears throat> there are a couple of things more that I would like to mention here. Uh, one of them uh, is about the fact uh, that uh, role-playing is a part of wider cultural tissue. And uh, um, notions, some <coughs> concepts and ideas that were uh, embodied in uh, role-playing practices. Uh, nothing comes to me, uh, to my mind, about LARPs, because my main source of knowledge of LARPs uh, is Olga and Anna. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, um, I met a, a very interesting text uh, about uh, the history of mana, uh, how Astronasian concept became a video game mechanic. Uh, referring to, uh, it, it's a text by Alex Golub, uh, published uh, in uh, June uh, 2014, uh, uh, where um, he writes about uh, mana as uh, a magical energy possessed by druids, uh, Maths, priests, shamans, and uh, which can be measured in points, uh, uh, as you probably know. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is not something that the designers of uh, Rogo of Warcraft invented uh, from scratch, uh, like uh, um, some other notions that came to our usage from uh, Polynesian. Uh, language like 
tatu, tabu, tiki, and some others. Uh, mana means something like uh, supernatural power uh, there in a very wide geographical region. And <clears throat> this concept became a staple of the global culture of fantasy novels and video games. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, you see, uh, uh, it, it's a good illustration uh, of the fact that not only fictional worlds of uh, fic uh, fantasy fiction or films, uh, or even video games, can influence uh, something uh, in role-playing domain, but uh, some other sources too. And the other thing um, that I would like to mention to conclude is something that I would like you to read. Uh, uh, it's a chapter from uh, Stanislav Lems. Do you know who Stanislav Lem is? He's a great uh, science fiction author and philosopher. He has some non-fiction writing. And this non-fiction writing is extremely interesting. Not everything is translated into English, unfortunately. And his uh, philosophy of Shipadko uh, is not translated, at, but it, it's translated to Russian. Uh, but the other, the other uh, uh, famous book of him, it's called Summa Technologia. Uh, sorry. Uh, in Russian, Summa Technology it was published in translation first time in 1968, and recently it was published in a second print uh, uh, with comments uh, from Pereslegin, uh, a guy who is famous in uh, methodology uh, community and uh, who has some knowledge of role-playing games as an instrument. Uh, in English, Summa Technology was uh, published uh, three years ago, and it's available even on Amazon. So, uh, uh, Stanislav Lem there has a whole chapter uh, uh, with the title Phantomatics. He says, uh, uh, he, he invites us to a, a thought experiment. Uh, imagine that we uh, take uh, a person uh, to whose nervous system we have a direct, con a direct connection. And we can connect some piece of technology in order to deceive his nervous system and insert uh, electrical stimuli, stimuli that uh, uh, would make this person perceive some different reality. Uh, we, for example, could uh, send a person to the moon, record everything that his nerves uh, make pass to his brain, uh, and this recording to put them into the nervous system of the other person. Uh, in that way, this perception would be substituted and uh, such a machine that uh, would make a person immerse into a different world uh, would be a perfect phantom art uh, only if uh, there would be a feedback, because uh, perceptions are not enough. Uh, uh, there is a need in feedback from the world uh, because uh, that person uh, to, to get a complete illusion of immersion this person would need uh, to be able to act in that world not only perceive something like in a movie theater and technically that also would be uh, possible so uh, Stanislav Lem invites us to think about the limits of uh, this situation and uh, about the sphere of phantomatics 
uh, more broadly uh, posited uh, in a cultural field. Uh, I think that it's a good point for us to think of uh, LARPs as uh, a special stage uh, in the development of broadly understood weak type of fantomatics in Western cultures. Think about what kinds of uh, functions does it play uh, in our society. And please pay attention to the forms that it takes. Uh, I think that this is a whole program for academic study of LARPs. And my sincere desire is uh, that uh, your conference um, becomes a starting, uh, a start of a long story that would bring us to new discoveries and successful uh, ideas that would uh, make you famous. <laughs> Those who are not famous already. <laughs> Thank you.